So all the way from Ted is architect, designer, creative thinker, Magnus Larsson. Good morning. I'd like to show you a couple of projects that begin to push architecture into the realm of synthetic biology and biotechnology. And I'd like to discuss this notion of radical optimism. But before I do that, I'd like to ask you, when was the last time you took a handful of brown, muddy sand, lifted it up to your mouth and swallowed it? Right. So I did that about 20 minutes ago. And uh, what I'm trying to get to here is that sand is really something that's determined by and defined by the size of the particles. So any material uh, with a particle size between 0 0.0625 and 2 millimeters is technically sand. That means you probably had quite a bit of sand for breakfast this morning, as salt, pepper, sugar and coffee are all sand. Now obviously usually we talk about sand, we think about sand as the stuff that we find on beaches, and in deserts. And it's a fascinating material. It's been estimated that one billion grains of sand come into existence around the world every second. Uh, that's a cyclical process. As mountains die, grains of sand are born. So some of those grains of sand may then cement naturally back into sandstone as that sandstone withers, new grains break free, and so on and so forth. At times, the grains can accumulate on a massive scale and turn into a sand dune. In a way, the static mountain becomes a moving mountain of sand, and that can be a little bit dangerous. Uh, so what this project is about is trying to overcome a bit of that danger through architecture. Um, I call this project Dune, and what I propose is that we build a 6,000 kilometer long wall across the entire continent of Africa. Um, about the size of the Great Wall of China, this wall, this habitable wall, would be made up from particles that are invisible or near invisible to the naked eye, bacteria and grains of sand. So I'm presenting an architectural response to an environmental threat. The threat is desertification. And my architectural response is this habitable wall. So it's a wall made from bacterially solidified sandstone. Um, now, to begin that discussion, dry areas cover more than one-third of the Earth's land surface. Some of that is desert, some of it is just parts that are being uh, very, very degraded by the shifting sands. Right south of the Sahara Desert, we find an area called the Sahel. And the Sahel, the name means the edge of the desert. And it was here that in the late 60s and early 70s, major droughts made about three million people dependent upon emergency food aid, with up to 250,000 people dying. Um, we got a lot of media reports back in those days of this catastrophe that was happening. These days, today, we don't get as much um, in the news about desertification. And still, it's something that aff that's affecting 110 countries worldwide and some 70% of the Earth's agricultural drylands. So it, it is a massive issue still to this day. How massive? What might happen? Well, you get climate change, you get global warming, you get increased droughts, uh, increased desertification, crashing food supplies, water scarcity, famine, forced migration, warfare, camps, and that's a proper catastrophe that we have on our hands. That's a worst case scenario, admittedly, but it's not an, an unlikely scenario, and it's kind of one that's waiting to happen again. How far away is it? Well, I went to Sokoto in northern Nigeria to try and find out. Um, here I am with the elders of Gidankara, a little village outside of Sokoto. I'm the second person on the left in the image there. And um, in this area, the, shifts, uh, sorry, the sands are shifting at a pace of between 300 and 600 meters a year. So that's the desert eating up a meter a day, a little bit more, uh, of, of the, um, the arable land in, the, in, in these uh, areas of the world. And that's why people have to move with the sands as they shift. Uh, 
So if the desert starts encroaching or you're on your um, habitat, you can't stay. This is why, this is the sand dune that threatened this village, Gidankara, in 1987. They actually had to move their village, hut by hut, from this place, which is the top of the sand dune, to a different location. And it took us about 10 minutes to climb to the top of that sand dune, which goes to show why they had to move. So that's the bad news. The good news is that about half a decade ago, 23 African countries came together and they started something called the Green Wall Sahara Initiative. So the initial plan uh, called for the creation of a shelter belt of trees to be planted right across the continent, from Mauritania in the northwest all the way over to Djibouti in the east. Um, that's a, a traditional way of trying to stop a desert on a massive grand scale, an unheard of scale. Um, what you want to do in order to stop a desert dune in its tracks is you want to make sure that the grains of sand don't avalanche over the crest of the dune. And some of the best ways of doing that is to, to use some kind of sand catcher. Trees or cacti are good for this, but one problem with trees is that the poverty in these areas bring people to chop them down for firewood. So I'm saying there might be an alternative to just planting a lot of trees and hoping that people won't chop them down. So what my scheme does is essentially three things. It adds a roughness to the surface texture of the dune, which helps to bind down the grains as they avalanche. Uh, it adds a physical support structure for the shelter belt of trees, and it creates habitable spaces inside of this barrier. And the idea there with the, with the last part is that if you bring people closer to the trees, if they start living in close proximity to the trees, they might help safeguard them both from the forces of nature and from other people. So essentially you can view a sand dune, uh, if you're a designer, as, as a ready-made building. All we need to do is solidify the sand dune where we want surfaces or areas to be solid and then excavate the sand that we don't need and that's how we get our architecture. Or we can have the wind excavated for us. So the wind will carry the material onto the site and then carry the excess material away from the site, which I find to be a very soft and nice design method. How do you solidify a sand dune, you might ask? Well, maybe you use these guys. Uh, a microorganism called Bacillus pasteuri, which is readily available in wetlands and marshes, and which has the, the fascinating, brilliant capacity or property that they do solidify loose sand into sandstone if you pour them on top of sand. So I learned about these bugs from uh, a professor at UC Davis called Jason de Jong. He's a brilliant guy. Uh, he managed to turn loose sand into sandstone in a mere 1,400 minutes using this technology. Uh, here are some images from the American Society of Microbiology showing how it's done. Essentially, you pour the, the bacteria on top of the sand, they start filling up the voids in between the individual grains of sand. A chemical process uh, then produces something called calcite, and calcite is like nat nature's own cement. It's like a glue that binds the grains together. The entire process takes about 24 hours. It starts gelling within minutes. It takes about 24 hours. In order to cure an entire sand dune with this process, we need to saturate the dunes. We need to flush the bacteria through the sand an optimal amount of about six times, which means, in theory, we should be able to create a building this way in about a week. Here I am playing the part of the mad scientist at UCL in London, uh, working with a few of these bacteria. How much does this cost? You might wonder, well, a back of the envelope kind of calculation would show that if we take the machining costs aside, the, the material cost itself for creating maybe a cubic meter of concrete would be in the region of, say, $90. Whereas without the machining costs, again, a cubic meter of, of bacterial sand might be in the region of $11. How do we construct something like this? Well, I'll quickly show you two options. One would be to create a kind of pneumatic balloon structure that we'd put up in the desert. We'll fill that with the bacteria and the nutrients that are necessary for them to survive. We'll then allow the sand dune and the background in this image to wash over the structure, and then we'll disseminate the bacteria through the skin of the, of the balloon, maybe a double skin. Um, so if you like, we'll pop the balloon. And five or ten years down the line, using permacultural strategies, uh, water harvesting, uh, things like that, we might be able to green the desert from within. 
A different way of doing this would be to use injection piles, which is an existing technology. So we would push down the piles into the sand dune itself, start spreading out an initial surface of bacteria to harden a surface inside a floor, datum or surface, if you like, inside of the dune. And then as we pull these, these piles up through the dune, we can create almost any conceivable surface with the loose sand acting as a jig for, for the surface that we're making. We then excavate the sand, or again, somehow make sure that we design it so that the wind excavates it for us, and we have our architecture. So we have a way of creating sandstone buildings out of loose sand, but what should they look like? Well, my architectural forms were inspired by something called tifoni, which is a cavernous rock structure that I found on the side in Nigeria. And I realized that if I scale those structures up, I get really interesting kind of spatial things to work with. So I get a hollow structure that filters in sun, yet shelters from the sun, and we could have good, good uh, properties for, for uh, ventilation and thermal comfort. A bit of the formal control of this would be lost to nature as the bacteria do their work. And I find this to, to give rise to a kind of boundless beauty. The, the traces, if you like, of the bacteria being harnessed to sculpt the desert into these habitable spaces. Um, people talk about biodiversity. That could be a problem locally, but if we, if we can manage to change the biodiversity in a way within these areas, that would clearly be changing it to the better. So we're not trying to, you know, pave paradise or anything. Uh, the bacteria are non-pathogenic. They won't spread when we stop feeding them, and we won't turn Sahara into uh, a massive parking lot. Hopefully. So, that's the project. Um, now I'm going to try and tell you why uh, we have this, uh, this kind of idea of radical optimism. So these are some images of me in July 2008, a few minutes after my tutors at the school where I carried out all the research for this project told me that it was a complete failure and that I should come back and do, uh, you know, take a, uh, another year and pay them some more tuition fees and uh, they wouldn't they wouldn't let me through with it. It wasn't architecture, something like that. At this point, I was pretty pessimistic, I'd say, about the entire project and about life itself. Uh, but then something happened. Uh, just a few weeks later, I got to go to Morocco, uh, to Marrakesh, and accept an award for the same project and a sizable price sum of money um, and some recognition. And that made me wonder, Maybe I should stop being pessimistic. Maybe I should start being optimistic about this project. Maybe I should think that maybe my tutors could be wrong. Uh, so what I did was I sent off an email to my favorite architecture critic, Jeff Manow, uh, who I think is, is probably the best architecture writer on the planet. And I asked him if he might be interested in featuring this uh, project on his website. And about half a year later, he did so, and he published this really nice write-up on the building blog. And following that, um, quite a few other articles, Slashdot, Wired, PSFK, Trend Hunter, Boston Globe, and my favorite, the LA Times, followed. The LA Times, my favorite, because it talks about an award-winning mad scientist anti-desertification plan. That was nice. So the mad scientist architect was then invited to uh, present this at TED to a global audience. And following that, some other articles came about. One asking the question, can a wall made from solidified sand um, help stop desertification? And another one saying, bacteria can prevent desertification in the future, which goes to show or means that my tutors were wrong because everything you read on the internet is true. So. I'm now trying to spread this idea in different ways, both commercial and, and academic. And I just wanted to show you a few images of an academic workshop that I did in Jerusalem a little while back. So we had four teams of designers, industrial designers working together with architects. The first team thought about this technology, how to take it further, and they came up with the idea of weaving sandstone structures. So weaving stone. So by spreading fibrous net structures across sand dunes and then kind of dipping those in bacteria, uh, they could create these beautiful, beautiful um, domed structures 
as, as the sand is then shifted away from, from the solidified parts. The other team came up with the idea of reversed archaeology, which I think is beautiful. So they thought if we seed existing sand dunes with bacteria, we could create the ruins of the future. And over the, the course of centuries, the sand would wash away and people would walk up to these things and have a planet of the ape moment. So on to uh, a second project uh, called Crystal Lines. What we're doing now in my studio in London is we're looking at a lot of different granular, fibrous, crystalline materials, shells, sponges, spores, things like that. And uh, we're trying to find out a little bit more about their properties and whether they can be harnessed in similar ways. So can we have them, can we use them to grow our architecture for us? And, and the important way here, the radically optimistic take, is to go beyond biomimicry. So this is not about, you know, whereas I like biomimicry, this is not about looking at a shark fin and then building a similar shape or using that geometry uh, or, 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 or that, um, the way that that works and then rebuild that in glass and, and steel. But instead, we're trying to build using nature itself. So uh, this project, which is very sketchy, is about building through the growing of crystals. If you look at crystals in nature, they are usually amazingly architectural in their geometries and in their scale. Uh, so you get these amazing kind of caves with large, huge crystals that have been formed um, over quite a few years, and we're wondering now, can we speed up that process? Some designers and artists have worked with this already. Tokuji Nyoshioka's uh, Venus chair is a good example, uh, which I think is quite beautiful. Also, we have Roger Yorn's seizure sculpture that won the Turner Prize the other year, uh, copper sulfur crystals being grown. So, if we marry this idea of growing crystals with the precipitation strategies of the June project that I just told you about, we might be able to grow both the material and the binding agent of our buildings at the same time, which would be uh, quite a, a massive thing. And if we experiment with the substrate, we might be able uh, to control further how these crystals actually grow into arrays and different geometries. So that's very much work in progress, as you can see, but that's where we're at in terms of the part of our practice that tries to push architecture into these realms of synthetic biology and biotechnology. Now, this is a, um, an advertising sign that I took a photograph of in the London Tube the other day. And it essentially says, if you like working with something, that's not a problem. It's a great thing. And I think this is the underlying kind of strategy or philosophy uh, behind what I'm, what I'm trying to tell you now is that I hear a lot of talk about problems during the days, a lot of talk about creative problems. And, you know, it goes something like this. We need to find the problem. We need to define the problem. What is the problem? How can we solve the problem? And I have a problem with that because I don't believe in architectural problems or in creative problems. Someone wants to give you money to do something, that's great. What's the problem? But why does there need to be a problem to be solved? It's a dream. It's not a problem. And this kind of takes me to one of my heroes, the design and advertising genius Tibor Kalman. Um, or Tibor, rather. Tibor said, I think he was the first person to bring up um, or define himself as a radical optimist. And one of his designs, a rather iconic design, is for uh, an umbrella with a very radically optimistic sunny sky on the inside. And I think this kind of don't worry, be happy attitude is really what we need if we are to find some unpredictable, interesting, maybe a little bit strange um, projects or, or, or experiments. So I think we need to change language, really. I think it needs to start there. We need to stop talking about problems. And instead, we should talk about challenges. So we should try and find a challenge and then work on that challenge trying to stay on the sunny side of the umbrella for long enough so that we can come up with an unpredictable, beautiful, maybe slightly strange um, response to that challenge. And I think that's the way ahead. Thank you very much. Magnus, thank you. Let's just thank have you. a quick, I have one quick question for you, a quick talk here in our, sorry about the chairs, they're not, neither made out of bacteria, they're made out uh, of dead. Yeah. 
dead trees. Um, you said, don't worry, be happy, which is, but, but what I'm thinking about, so you, you, you told me beforehand that in Sweden, you are an architect, because in Sweden, supposedly, we enjoy silos, like, did you study business? Well, you know economics, and you are an architect, and if, if you go into an architectural firm, there are mainly architects there. If you go into a bank, there are mainly bankers. Now, what you're showing us here is, first, there's an element of wanting to crush the newness. Like you, you're coming with a new, different idea. No, no, that's not architecture. This is not, this is not the, the way of our company, the way of our institution. And then you go abroad and you trade and you try a different track in. And isn't, isn't that really what we need to create? Maybe not optimism, but, but the innovation. I'm, I'm thinking about Danny's talk as well. Mm. The friction of a differently minded person coming from the bacteria and seeing how that could be applied in this case, or may maybe bacteria could help banks as well. But not just in killing bankers, but, but right, uh, no. Yeah. You know what I'm saying. Mm. Um, have you, uh, uh, do you continue to suffer from this in Sweden? That people are like, oh, so we have some sort of architect here and he's knocking on our door. And leave us alone. <laughs> no, not really, no. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't spend that much time in, in Sweden, actually, at okay. the moment. Uh, I'm, why I'm would usually you? in London. Uh, yeah, it's too cold here. But um, no, I, don't, I don't have that problem. I think that the way to attack it, whether bacteria is right for banking or not, I, I, I'm going to leave aside. But I think the way to attack it is to try and, and kind of step out of um, the problem thinking. So most bankers will probably have a set view on what banking should be or could mm. be. And most architects will probably have um, a similar view of what architecture should or could be. And I think the only way to really try and, and get to the floss brief flop of, of the previous talk, of Danny's talk, is to try and, and attack things from a new point of view. And the only way I think that we can do that is to stop thinking about the usual problem-led um, kind of design methodology. So if we start saying, okay, we have a planet that goes through a very kind of scary moment, and admittedly every generation probably thinks that, that we're going through a scary moment, but maybe in a more kind of accelerated fashion than that today, uh, than ever before, we, we hear about these population increases, we hear about global warming, we hear about CO2, a lot of things that, um, that are quite worrying. We could either kind of think about them as great problems and we can try and solve them, or we can we can view them as challenges. And if we view them as challenges, we might actually say, hey, there might be a creative take on this. Maybe we can actually use these so-called problems to come up with something new. Maybe we can even make money from them. You know, that um, may not be wrong. That might thank be you for part being on the now. barricades and driving that shift, minus last time, for coming to Good Morning 2020. Thank you. German, German expressionistic art coming right up. And, uh, and here you go for your plane ride over to London. Oh. Thank you. We, want, we don't want you to be to be to be bored.